we're just going to continue to go right through the Bible. Okay, so be ready for that. Now, today is uh, the sermon title is "I've Lost My Taste and My Sight" from Matthew five thirteen through twenty. Now, you would know this as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, sometimes some of your translations will say the the Sermon on the Hill. Some of them will say the Sermon on the Plain. Because if you can imagine on the mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee, the mountain is really close to the sea here. It's on the northern coast. And as a result of that, uh, you could see long distances, a beautiful vista. But where the mountain came down, it got kind of flat, like a little tabletop right there. And that's where it's thought that Jesus sat or stood on the hillside, probably sat. And he had this, this, this lesson. Now, if you look at Matthew, it begins in chapter 5, and it says Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, okay? But then if you go through, it is all of chapter 5. It is all of chapter 6. It goes into chapter 7 and ends at the end of chapter 7. Now, uh, it is thought by some scholars that this is not one teaching, but rather a multiple series of teachings. Regardless, if your Bible is uh, red ink for where Jesus speaks, you'll note that all of this is red ink, okay? Pretty much all of it is. So it's important that you recognize that as we, as we teach these lessons, we've already been through the Beatitudes, but now we're on salt and light and law and the <coughs> And hopefully we can tie those together for you. Stacy, are you ready? Yes, First of all, though, was there something you were passing around? I have a card for Pastor Larry. Okay. For everybody to sign. Okay. So, so thank you. And they're going to sign it today? Yeah, I'm going to sign it. Have it a couple of weeks so to make sure everybody needs to sign it for Pastor Larry. So we can give it to him. Pastor Larry is a man of grace, and he's been wonderful through all this. Uh, Pastor Larry, really, I, I told him that we had marching bands parades all planned um and and he said cancel the marching band canceled parade he said he really doesn't want to fuss but we will do something now here's the problem we just don't know when that's going to be right and that's not his fault my fault your fault we're just waiting on the paperwork to come back uh pastor larry has asked me to uh, that he wants his final sermon to this church on june the 4th sunday june the 4th. so um we have youth, and I'll be doing all the other students from then on. And so just be aware. Now, Pastor Larry still going to be here. Uh, he still intends to help uh, where, where appropriate. So uh, just be aware that if we suddenly say to you quickly, hey, next Sunday, we're going to do this for Pastor Larry. I don't want you to think that why didn't we plan this better? It's because we don't know a date yet, right? So, um, and by the way it works, the Methodist Church, the day that our trustees sign that paper, we officially are disaffiliated as Methodist, and Pastor Larry is no longer our pastor, okay? So whatever day that is, we haven't gotten the paperwork, should be in a couple of weeks, but we just don't know, so just wanted to make you aware of that. Okay, hurry up. <laughs> Hold me up again. Sally, they can hold me up a dime, I know. Um, Sally Bennett has asked if we would provide the desserts for her stepdad's funeral dinner. Um, so if anybody can, bake pies or cakes, cookies, brownies, whatever, um, just bring them here to the church on Thursday, and she's going to take them up on Friday for the funeral. So they're expecting about 100 people. So. Let me know if you can bake, please. So please see Stacy, and and the date again is this Thursday. This Thursday. This Thursday night, she'd like to have the desserts here because the celebration will be here on Friday. It's not going to be here. I mean, but the the, uh, the fellowship dinner. The dinner's oh, not here either. It's not here either. <laughs> no. Okay, it's somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. We're just, we're just we're just providing the desserts. Sally's going to pick them up and take them. All right now. You, you need to get your, I was quick. You your announcements. <laughs> you can you use me. I don't know how you did that. You had a head up. Stacey, I'm with you. Hey, hey. Stacey, Women can be confusing, can't they? 
women can be confusing. So next Thursday night, have your desserts here, and Stacy's going to take care of us. Thank you. Stacy, are you ready to read? Stacy, are you ready to read? I am. Okay, please do. <laughs> <laughs> you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. So uh, the first question we outline is how do we lose taste for sight? I got to tell you this quick story. Years ago, I had a business lunch at Denny's, you know, on Route 11. And uh, we're sitting there having our business conversation. Look out the window, and there is a hired hired guy outside, string trim, okay, around the Denny's. And he has a fresh gauze covering one eye, okay, fresh. He's not wearing safety glasses. You can see stuff just flying. And I told the guy that I was eating with, I said, hey, let's watch. I think he's going for number two. <laughs> Okay, so how do we lose taste or sight? And here's because of time, let me let me kind of push a few of these points pretty quickly. I, I think that you recognize that sometimes we lose taste or sight in the conversation we're going to have today accidentally. Sometimes it just happens, right? Sometimes it's carelessness on our part. Sometimes it is... Um, yeah, it just happens slowly, right? So I, I want you to recognize that that uh, we all are susceptible to losing our taste and our sight, our saltiness and light. Okay. Now, why did Jesus use these metaphors to describe us? There's only a few places in the Gospels that Jesus uses metaphors to describe his believers. Uh, the most common that you would know is he, he says. Uh, my sheep will know me by my voice, okay? Uh, so he uses a sheep metaphor at times. and then, But here he's using salt and light. It's the only time in the Gospels that he uses salt and light to describe his believers. Why did he use those metaphors? Because the, the people that have the salt for a lot of time. Yeah. Yep. Well said. So um, today, guys, yes. They're, they're very common things. Everybody in any generation could relate. Yeah. And it all depends on what you mean by saltiness. Because there's some saltiness you might not exactly want yeah. in religious setting. Yeah, that's right. Um, a lot of Eastern, a lot of Eastern religions today will actually use salt in a purification or a cleansing ceremony. They will put it out and and they will add uh, they will add uh, flavoring to it so that it gives you an aroma. In some cases, they will literally burn it uh, so that you can smell it, and they call that a cleansing thing. But that's that's kind of uh, Eastern philosophy, but I, I do want you to understand that that uh, Kathleen is right. This is uh, this is something that any of the hearers at the Sermon on the Mount would understand. Salt is valuable, light's important, right? They get it, particularly when they didn't walk into their house and flip a switch and the lights came on. You know, they they really understood it. 
um, how could you lose your saltiness or become dim? And if you note, I, I have a lot of blanks there because I know there's going to be different opinions, but how can you lose your saltiness or become dim? <clears throat> Not dim-witted, but dim. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> yes, ma'am. Drifting away from the <clears throat> Yeah, drifting. Uh, it's uh, when I was at Campus Crusade for Christ, when I was in Virginia Tech, uh, we called it to be now. You know, somebody would come and they would express a, a, a belief and a faith in Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, a couple weeks later, they were gone. You, you couldn't get a hold of them. They weren't interested. We called that to be now, right? Like riding the tube down the snowbank. Um, and so, uh, yeah, sometimes you just drift away. You know, we're, if you're not best invested, you drift away. It's not important to you, it drifts away, right? Um, in fact, I, I, I put uh, in my notes, how can you lose your salt and you should become dim? It's a lot like gaining weight. You know, you, you look in the mirror one day and go, oh, wow. Hmm. You go weigh yourself and go, oh, oh no, right? It wasn't overnight. It usually is a long period of time. Now, there are, there are some tragic cases where um, I have personally been involved with people who it, it is, a, it is a, a moment in time. It is a second in experience, and they have lost their faith. They have decided, I, I'm not doing this anymore. It could be a tragedy, a loss of a loved one, an experience that's happened in their life that just overwhelms their faith belief and and uh it's tough right it, it's hard and so um yeah I, drifting another way to describe it is slowly I mean, sometimes like i said it could be quickly um why do i say that to you not because i suspect that you are or you have but this might be a cautionary tale for you Right? To just be aware that you can drift away, right? It, it just happens. Yes, ma'am. Um, so in, in ancient days, also, some salt wasn't as pure as other salt was. Uh, and so what would happen is the um, pure salt would be smaller and look at the top. And so you would use up, if you salt losing its saltiness, you'd use all the good salt off the top first. And everything that was left underneath wasn't salty anymore. And so, again, if you filled with impurity, and you're letting yourself drift into the world. I, I guess it's drifting and everything. I mean, but if you're letting yourself be influenced by the world, you've got all that mixed together. Once the salt part is gone, all you're left with is the world. Great point. In, in fact, this is why I'm excited about our youth program. Um, a lot of people, if they don't come to an understanding of their faith in Jesus Christ, by the time they leave high school, it becomes, the door is harder to stay open. Um, that's why so many young people who maybe attend church, maybe they're active in church, they go to college where they're influenced by a lot of liberal mechanisms and, and uh, the, the behaviors there. And suddenly you find that they come back after a semester or two semesters or whatever. And, and they say, you know, I don't believe in this stuff anymore. And so it becomes really, really important and I believe many of us feel this way at church that we need to invest in our youth because once they've left, once they've left the the the, the uh, confines, if you will, once they lift, once they've gone outside the electric wire of the fence, uh, you don't know where they drift off to, right? So uh, it can happen quickly, it can happen slowly, it can happen happen a time. Right? Um, remember that all of us can have moments when maybe our light becomes dimmer or maybe we're not as salt. And so I would caution you not to get on the treadmill of guilt, okay? Uh, think of the stories in the gospels. As you read, as we go through the entire Bible, we started at Matthew 1, go through the entire Bible, you're gonna hear stories of even Jesus' disciples 
who had questions. They doubted. Okay. Even uh, when Jesus was leaving in Matthew chapter 28 and he's ascending to heaven, it said many believed, but some doubted. But who was there? His disciples were the ones who were there. So some of them, even as they're watching the resurrected Christ, glorified body, they're watching him ascend to heaven. And some of them are going, I'm still not sure if I get this. Okay. So if that's the case, and there are times when you wake up and you scratch your head and say, God, I'm not sure if I follow this. Don't feel guilty. Just recognize that it's part of our faith wall. But we have to get back to the light again. We have to get back to saltiness again. And that becomes important. All right. So look, you have your own story here. So how can you lose your saltiness or become dim? I know we're rushing through this, but I would ask you to pull this paper back out during the week and ask your own personal question here. How have I done this? And by naming those things, listen to this, by naming those things, it puts you on your guard. <clears throat> if you recognize that, hey, when I was in this circumstance, I drifted backwards in my faith, then by naming that, it helps you to know, be careful. It's like those of us who operate equipment. And, you know, you look back, and that cutter that you're pulling, it skins up a tree and you recognize immediately, you start saying to yourself, I can't get that close, right? You don't shut the tractor off and quit. You figure out how to compensate differently and you're more aware and more careful. I can tell you to do the same thing here. Just make sure that you're paying attention to it. So name the thing in your life that has perhaps pulled you back, made your faith dim, Maybe made you question it, name it, and then we can work with it. So now look, why did Jesus teach about the law and the prophets? Uh, this is a curious thing. Why did Matthew specifically follow that? <clears throat> is it because Jesus is in a limited amount of time? Um, you know, everybody took too long to get their coffee and donuts, so he has to rush. And is he, is he, is he just going through it really quickly? Okay, this is one thing to be aware of. This is two, this is three. I, I don't know. I would tell you that if you really get into a theological conversation, these two can bookend each other. That's why I preached on them that way today. And that's why we're teaching that way today. Because the law and the prophets is what the people of the day the Jews were relying on, I have been a law follower. Some of you would describe yourself as a rule follower, right? Particularly if you're an accountant, you're a rule follower. Uh -oh. Okay. Um, you would describe yourself as a rule follower. And, and so there's nothing wrong with that. But what Jesus is suddenly saying is, he's saying to the group, I have fulfilled. Now look what he says. Uh, follow me in, in chapter 5, we're in, in verse 17. Um, he says in New International Version, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them the law and the prophets. So um, if you were Jewish, you'd be familiar with what's called the Tanakh. Okay, the Tanakh is basically um, the first five books of the Bible, Pentateuch, and it begins to incorporate what the prophets were teaching. Okay, the major prophets. <clears throat> Um, pretty much Jews today, generally speaking, have the same Old Testament that you have. There's a few minor exceptions. So that's kind of what they had, right? The book of Malachi, the last book we have in the Old Testament, was written about, it was completed about 320 years before <coughs> Jesus was born, okay? So there's a gap between the Old Testament and New Testament. So I want you to think about this. They had the Old Testament. So Think about how they were taught and learned about their faith. Their faith was God has given us commands. He gave us the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments. The first four of those Ten Commandments are dealing with a vertical relationship with God. Okay? You should have know the gods before me, you know, honor the Sabbath, you know, those kind of things, right? And then the last six deal with the horizontal relationship between human beings, okay? 
you know, do not murder all the way through, right? So as you think about that concept, we kind of get the cross out of that. But to a Jew, they began to say, okay, I have lived all those commands. I am a good person. So the religious leaders over the years, and when Moses first gave them the Ten Commandments, began to expand on those. And they added basically 603 other laws for a total of 613 laws through the Old Testament. And they expanded it to where, okay, it's not only that you shouldn't sacrifice uh, a baby goat in the milk of its mother, which is one of those laws, to you shouldn't murder somebody, to all of a sudden, wait a minute, you shouldn't walk the 1,200 steps on the Sabbath. If you walk 1,201 steps, you've broken the law. Now, heaven forbid, you walk 1200 you, you know think of these these pharisees were in fit bits yeah. and they were looking and they're going all right get my chair i gotta sit down and, and, and so think of that mindset think of the mindset of it's all about these rules and if i break one of them i'm no longer in the will of god I want you to think about this. Now, the Pharisees understood that was a minor law, and I'm going to pray about it, and God's going to forgive me. But the typical human being walking around, the typical Jew who had little, if any, education, formal education, would have felt condemned. And then what do you think their faith is? I am condemned. I am guilty. I don't think God loves me. Right, Kenny? Oh, we're really good at it. Well, and, and I would submit, uh, I would submit that Ken's point is pretty important here for you, that we do get caught up in this, right? And the Jews did, but I would submit that I think as Christians today, we <laughs> often do, right? We often begin to, uh, you know, we signal, uh, you're not mm. as virtuous as me, you're not as good as me, I'm not as good as you, uh, you know, you're doing that so you can get recognition. We have all these mixed signals. Yes, ma'am. Um, it, it, I'm not certain that they actually, we translate it into English as commands and laws. I think they saw it more as external behavior. There, where Jesus is revolutionary is he talks about motivation. And at the time, there wasn't a Jew alive who cared what anybody's motivation was. It was all about what were you doing on the outside. outside yeah. So, it, so fasting without showing it, what's that by you? I mean, that, that's why they, they weren't this in uh, the way we think of it, it, showing off. They were expected to display behavior. And it, all that gets lost in translation to, to, to 21st century English. Thank you. Great point. Ken? Yeah. Your example, Captain for the which physically just doesn't work very well. You've got to put high enough that you can't hold it. You've got to get through hot, hot, cold. But that's how we metaphorically explain it. But the important part is the cross. Where are the, where's that cross at? How far is it at? That's our human activity. Mm -hmm. And there I'm sitting there with a beer in one hand and the rest of the other. Where I'm at. And it's pretty bad to put light on. And it moves up and down. And when you get the Greek Orthodox, they've got another cross across there. I don't understand that at all. <laughs> but it's how we interact. Yeah, there's it is. It, and that's where we become salt and light world, right? Salt and light world. Now, listen, I want
want you to understand this. Jesus is saying this, and it's important. He said that he fulfilled all the law and the prophets. So he's telling the Jews, you've been on the wrong pathway. You're thinking it's about your outward behavior. And Jesus is saying, I fulfilled all this. Listen to what I'm telling you is important. And eventually, where does he get to the message? The two greatest commands are love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. It's all about, it's all about relationship with God and relationship with others. And he's not really worried about the fact that you walked 1,237 steps on the Sabbath. Okay? He's worried about your inward motivation. So another way to say this in some of your translations, the real old translations would say, Jesus would have said, I have not come to annul them, but to fulfill them. Annul means to forget them. He didn't come to say we forget them. He came to make them complete. All right? We got to keep going. So how did a Jew expect to get to heaven? Remember that it's this is oversimplifying, but for, for speed, righteousness. I am right with God. Translate that a little loosely. If I am good enough, I'll be in heaven. That's how a Jew felt. Okay. Now, why did what did Jesus say that turned it on his head in verse 20? He says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. He's basically turning their faith statement on its head and says, You can't be good enough to get there. If you are better than the Pharisees, unless you are better than them, and to an average Jew, they would go, they would have taken and thrown their, their cloaks up in the air and said, oh, we're done, right? No way we can do it. So what is the plan? So what is the plan? Here's what I want you to grab. It becomes important that you understand that Jesus says, I fulfilled the law and the prophets. You know what he's saying? I am the plan. I am the plan. They were saying, how do we get God's good grace? How do we get his favor? How do we impress God? How do we become right before God? How do we get to heaven? How do we have faith, statement, understanding, and unshaken assurance that we're going to get to heaven? And they couldn't come up with it. Man can't come up with that. And Jesus suddenly says, I didn't come to annul that. I didn't come to cancel that. I came to make sure you understood I am the fulfillment of that. So Jesus becomes the standard, right? Now, what then is the value of goodness? I put that there. Um, so Barb Salyer and I were having this conversation before class. And, you know, it, at some point, all of us come to the realization that uh, there can be an atheist sitting beside of us who just says, there is no God. You can't prove it to me. And yet they are a good person. They do good things, right? So good is not always the only indicator of your faith. It can be, but it's not always the case. Uh, we don't have time to go into it, uh, what some Barna tests are or Barna surveys are about how people feel about how people are. But at the end of the day, I think uh, the way that I would say, what then is the value of our goodness? I would tell you it's a way for you to demonstrate your faith. So when you help somebody in the world, when you give money, when you give your talent and your time, it is a way for you to demonstrate your faith. Is it the only way? Absolutely. But it is a way. Uh, one way to put this in kind of pithy terms or kind of stick to your terms is that my goodness as a result of my gratefulness for God. Okay. I'm grateful that Jesus died on the cross for me. And my goodness is a way to be great. Right? It's a way for me to demonstrate my faith to others. Um, in business, uh, we would sometimes tell people to show, tell, and do. Okay? Let me show you how to do this. Now you tell me how to do it. Now you go do it. Right? Show, tell, and do. It's a great way to educate people. Uh, particularly in vocational education, teaches this way all the time, uh, but it's a great way to train people, right? 
and it's a great way to express your Somebody can show you what we're talking about. You tell them, which means you're learning it, and then you go and practice it. You go and do it. So what could you do to add salt or light to the world? That would be the challenge that I really want to leave you with. Um, how can you add salt and light to the world? Um, I think it is clear here that Jesus challenges us in our faith, that we have to do something about our faith. That, uh, and, and what Ken said earlier is not wrong. I'm not sure if I usually say that. Yeah, I'm not sure if I usually say that. But in this case, I don't think you were wrong at all. And that is that sometimes your faith is a private, quiet faith, and no one needs to know anything. That's, that's fine. You're still practicing your faith. You're practicing your faith where others may not see it. That's great. There are times, though, when God calls us out that we have to be public in the way that our faith expresses itself. I'm not going to tell you what that litmus test is. You, you, that's kind of where you have to go in your own walk here. For some of you, you have, uh, you have been salt and light behind the scenes, and somebody could know you for 10 years, and they wouldn't know a lot of things you've done. That's okay. That's okay. For others of you, because of the salt and light that you are, it is in front of people, and that's okay, too. That's good, right? That's where you have to be. Uh, so remember, we have some people who have been on our prayer chain since the inception. And I think we started the prayer chain in the mid-80s, I believe. 85, I think. Been a long time. And some people have been on the prayer chain the entire time. And I promise you, you don't know their names. Well, I know one of them. But they have been salt and they have been light since 1985. I'm pretty sure that's the date. Think about the number of years there. And you don't know their names. You don't have to, right? God well, knows your name. That's right. God does, but you don't have to. All right. So just appreciate that sometimes God calls you to be salt and light in ways that I don't get and it I can't do. And as my dad used to say, and vice versa, right? So just remember that you are called to be salt and light. Um, add that value to the world. It really is. It is a way to kind of put some steroids in your face. You begin to understand, wait a minute, I do add value to the world. Wait a minute, what I do does make a difference, right? Sometimes you'll see it and sometimes you won't, but you just have to do it anyway, okay? And finally, I leave you with this. Um, during the Greek times and during the Roman times, uh, particularly practiced by Middle Easterners, even the Jews, there were times when they invaded an enemy that they hated so much, they would literally take quantities of salt, which is worth a lot of money, and they would salt the fields so that it would never grow another crop. Okay. Yep. Romans did it at Carthage. Okay. Now, I want you to appreciate that. Think about that. They hated them so bad, they took in those days, which would have been money, salt was money, and they would put it so heavy on the fields that it would never grow crops again. All right. That's one way salt could be used. Another way is you make the world flavorful. Yes, ma'am. My dog, they still do that. Um, this one lady was um, doing a community garden. She did it for years. And somebody came during the season when it's not time to you know plant yet and salted her fields. So she can't grow anything in those fields, right? Yeah. 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 Eventually, yeah, but it takes a while. Ken, Ken can go up there and probably three months. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sad. But Sad. I think that you have to recognize what are you going to be? Are you going to be salt that does damage? Are you going to be salt that does good? Are you going to be light that does damage? Or light that does good? It is a call. <laughs> Jesus challenges us to be those people. Let's send a word of prayer. Father God, thank you that. You have challenged us to be salt and light in the world. Lord, thank you that Jesus did fulfill the law. He came into the world so that by faith in him, we could have the assurance. We could have the confidence of eternal life. Thank you for that promise and that hope. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Don't forget, one service next week, 10 o'clock. All right, we know where those go. Yes, sir.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.